When you turn our attention back to our lesson, Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, the ninth chapter, we pick up reading at verse 6. Paul writes to us, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. This is the word of the Lord. question for you today, are you confused at times as to how life works? You try, you give it your best effort, you've invested yourself uh, into your personal life trying to work on those sinful habits, those sinful struggles, those parts of your life that you would like to eliminate, to, to overcome, to free yourself from, and you've had some success but maybe not as much as you'd like. You invested yourself into your marriage. You worked hard. You tried to be a better husband. You tried to be a better wife. You you read a bunch of things, some magazines, some articles. You went online. Maybe you got yourself into counseling. You listened. You paid attention. You tried to apply this. You tried to apply that. You focused and worked here, and you moved things forward, and, 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 and you made some progress, but it's It's still not the marriage that you want. You've done similar things in your career. Uh, Maybe you've tried similar things at church. Uh, You've tried this. uh, You've tried that. You've done this and you've done that. But still, you haven't moved the bar to any extent like you thought you could or you might or you wanted CNN uh, came out with a poll this month, and since they've been doing this polling, uh, we set a record uh, in America. You see, it's a very simple poll. You can self-identify. Are you very happy? Are you happy? Are you unhappy? Are you very unhappy? It's not hard. They just call you. They contact you online. They say, hey, where are you on this scale? And we set records at both ends of the spectrum. The largest, highest number of Americans now self-identify as very unhappy. And we have a record low number of Americans self-identifying as very happy. We just seem to be miserable people. We're just, you know, just not happy. This just isn't working. And so let me ask you this question. Do, do you find yourself like this? You know, no matter how hard you work, you just don't get ahead? So maybe what I started with is, right, you're, you're trying to improve yourself, you're trying to improve your marriage, you're trying to advance your career, you're, you're trying to do this and you're trying to do that. You've made some progress, but just not what you wanted, not what you expected, maybe not what you needed. So you did the all-American thing, you redoubled your effort, you tried harder, you focused more, you became more determined. And the more you did and the harder you tried and the greater effort that you put into it, you felt like these people, you know, in the wheel. You're going, 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 but you're not really moving forward. You're wearing yourself out, you're exhausting yourself, but you're making very little progress towards the goals that are so absolutely important to you. And if that's the case, if you feel like you're just on that rat race, you're on that treadmill, it's no wonder we have record numbers of people who say, you know, I'm just not happy. And fewer and fewer and fewer people who are saying, I am happy. And, you know, is this going to change? Is this going to get better? Are are things going to finally move in the right direction? Well, CNN reported on a Maris poll It's another one of those really simple ones. Are you optimistic about the future? Are you pessimistic about the future? And they've been doing this poll for decades. 
For the first time in 2022, in the first time since this poll began, less than 50% of Americans are optimistic about the future. We have become a pessimistic people. It's not going to get better. If anything, maybe it's going to get worse. So you say, gee, Danny, I'm really glad I came to church today. Thanks for picking me up. See. But maybe that's the point. See. Maybe that's exactly the point. Because you can say to me, well, Danny, it doesn't take a genius. I didn't have to go to the seminary. I didn't have to earn all those degrees to figure out why are we so unhappy, and why are we pessimistic, and why are we frustrated, and why are we confused, and why am I aggravated, and why am I having all these negative emotions about how things are going in my life? Are you not paying attention to what's going on, Danny? We are in the middle of a pandemic. Okay, maybe not the middle, but we don't know that. Every time we think we're going to step forward and step out, it comes raging back. Every time we think we've made some progress, okay, we don't have to wear masks everywhere. Uh, okay, we don't have to do this, we don't have to do that. Kids can go back to school. All the, it comes raging back. Come on, Danny, that's enough to make anybody pessimistic. We're in the midst of the highest inflation in 40 years. Food and gas prices and other things are rising and rising and rising and rising. The chain of supply is broken. You can go to Walmart or your favorite grocery store or someplace else, and there are empty shelves. You came to buy X. It's not even there. You can't even buy it. It doesn't take a genius to figure out how that could be frustrating and confusing, how that could be overwhelming, Danny. And I don't know, maybe you live under a rock, but we are in the middle of an election season, and it's ugly. And there's all kinds of mean-spirited, ugly things being said about people, by people. And I don't know about you, but I'm praying to God Tuesday gets here and gets done. Enough already. And in that world, Danny, it didn't take a genius to figure out why we're not happy. It didn't take a genius to figure out why we feel like we're on that treadmill and we're not getting forward and we're not making progress. It isn't a genius to figure out in the midst of all this stuff going on that we're confused about how life works. But I want to suggest that in the midst of all of that, there may be another key factor you're missing. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a political season, in the midst of inflation, in the midst of the breakdown of the supply chain, and, 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 I think we may be missing one key crucial reality. We talked about last week that the Word of God, only the Word of God, always the Word of God, was the sole norm and source of faith and life. Good Reformation sermon, way to go. Danny reminded us we're Lutherans, yeah. Did you mean it? Was it just a rah-rah moment for us LCMS people? Are you really on a life path that you're going to live God's way, or are you going to live your way? And are you trying to negotiate both lanes, uh, you know, in those confusing, aggravating, frustrating, pandemic, political, uh, inflationary times? You swerve over here, uh, God, here I am. I'm struggling. I'm confused. I'm angry. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I don't think I'm making much progress. Matter of fact, I kind of felt like I slipped a little bit backwards. God, help me, help me, help me. Then things calm down a little bit. You, you regain some composure, uh, and you kind of swerve back over into the other lane. I'll, I'll just live my, my way. Thanks, God, for getting me out of that jam. I really do appreciate it. I, I'll take over from here. Except maybe God's going to lead you to a crossroad. You've got to go one way or you've got to go the other, but you can't go both 
anymore. Is that today? Is that now? Is that in the midst of all that's going on? God says, look, my way or your way, but not both. Do you really want to live God's way? Do you really want to figure out how life works? Do you really want to unlock the key to the blessings of God? I can't do that in a single sermon unless you're willing to be here for most of the day. Okay, didn't think so. So let me focus on one way that you begin to live God's path and unlock the keys to the blessed life. Paul said, remember this, don't forget, carve it in your memory. If I call you on the carpet next week, I want you to be able to quote that Bible passage to me. Remember this, he said. Don't just pay attention to it because Danny's talking about it in the sermon. Don't just pay attention for the next 10, 15 minutes and you hope I'm that long. Remember this, he said. Make this a life-changing, life-following principle. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Anybody here not want to reap generously in your life? Uh, You know, if I had a lousy marriage, that's okay. No, we all want a great marriage. Anybody want lousy parent-child relationship? Well, they'll move out eventually. You know, I, I can endure until they do. It's okay. No, we all want great parent-child relationships. We want great friendships. We want a great ministry here. We all want to reap generously in our life. We want our careers to move along that path. We want our country to move along that path. You can't sow sparingly and expect to reap generously. You can't sow corn and hope to harvest soybeans. It doesn't work. You can't sow nothing and expect to harvest anything in the fall. But some of you are trying real hard. And you're more determined and you're more focused and you're trying harder. It's not going to work. What are we supposed to sow? Obedience. I'm supposed to sow obedience to God's will, to God's word in my life, and then I can reap generously the blessedness of God. If I sow something else in my life, my will, my way, your will, your way, the world's will, the world's way, I will not, cannot reap the generous blessings of God. But I'm trying. You're trying. So honestly, just with yourself, don't have to share it with anybody else, admit to yourself, where are you sowing in life? What are you sowing in life? How are you sowing in life? And then honestly ask yourself, how's that working for you? And if we go back, we don't have to be so confused about how life works. I am reaping what I sowed. Or I'm failing to reap because I failed to sow. It's not hard. It's not confusing. Where I'm at is where my plans and my efforts led me. If I want to be someplace else, I'm going to have to sow something else. How about obedience? And I'd like to remind you of something I talked about last November, and it'll fit into the next couple of weeks as well. But too many of us live in an impossible world. And what I mean by that is this. We operate by this philosophy. Nothing in something out. 
So I'm not going to come to church faithfully. And then every time somebody stands up here and says, hey, we got this opportunity, uh, we could do this, we could do that, we could move forward in this way, we could uh, care and love and serve in that capacity, uh, you just instantly say to yourself, no, he's not talking to me. Somebody else can do that. And so we offer fellowship opportunities, but you don't come, and we offer Bible studies, and you don't engage. And we do this, and we do that, trying to engage you, to get you to sow your time, your talent, and your treasure into the ministry, but you don't sow nothing in. But when life falls apart, you sure want something out of the church. When life goes in the wrong direction, you sure want to reap something where you sowed nothing. Now, by God's grace, the church will do all that it can to be there for you. Because it's not reciprocity, it's grace. It's not what have you done for me, it's what can I do for you. But you bring that same principle to your marriage. When he changes, when he listens, when he does things differently, our marriage will get better. When she changes, when she listens, when she does things differently, our marriage will get better. Nothing from me, but I sure want something from you. Same for our parents, same for our children, so on and so forth. It's an impossible principle. It doesn't work. Please quit. You can only reap what you sow. Let me talk about two important areas that you can reap. Can we put that next one up there? Paul wrote to the Galatians at the end of his letter, let us not grow weary of doing good. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't tire out. Don't step away. Paul said, don't grow weary in doing good, in loving, in helping, in encouraging, in building up, in investing your time, investing your talent, investing your treasure. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Farmers plant in the spring, but they don't take the summer off. If they do, they will reap very sparingly. You got to work and work and work and work and work. But the harvest will come, and you will reap generously. Don't give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Where should you sow your time, your talent, and your treasure? Where should you sow your obedience to God? Well, Paul says, how about right here? How about to the household of faith? How about freeing up your calendar so you can be more available, so we can do better ministry one to another? How about taking a hard look in the mirror and realizing God has given you some incredible gifts, some awesome talents, abilities, and skills. You are a unique creation of God. There's not another one of you. You can do things other people here can't do, at least not as well as you. You're not here by accident. You're not here by happenstance. You're not here because you chose to be here. God called you here because God needed your skills, your talents, and your abilities in this congregation, in this season. We're like that thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle that's sitting on your table, but there's one piece missing, and it just gnaws at you every time you walk past the table. That little missing piece just screams at you, we're not done, we're not complete, find it. And God says, no, I brought it to you, it's sitting right there. You are what completes this ministry. 
You are what makes it whole, complete, and fulfilled. Sow your talent, sow your skills, sow your abilities into this ministry, and yes, sow your treasure. Bless financially to be a blessing. Let it begin especially to those who are of the household of faith. If we don't love one another, if we don't care for one another, if our commitment to one another is not deep and life-changing, why would anybody come here? We're just another organization. We're just one more church in a long list of churches in Aurora. Or is this a place where lives are changed and people are loved and together they sing a new song to Jesus? Can we put that last one up there? Deuteronomy 15 speaks to the poor, the people who don't have, the needy, the broken, the hurting. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. I started out by saying, are you confused on how life works? I want my life to move forward. I want my marriage to move forward, my family. I want my church. I want my career. I want my community. I want my country to move forward. What has to change so that the Lord will bless my work, my effort, my attempts? What has to happen for the Lord to bless everything I put my hand to? Well, He told you. Give generously to the poor, to the broken, to the lost, to the needy, to the drug addict, the alcoholic, the porn addict, the sex addict, who ends up at Hesed House because they ruin their marriage, their kids won't talk to them, they've been fired so many times nobody wants to hire them, and as far as they know there's very few people who care. The single mom, the single dad, the aging widow or widower. The person who's wealthy, healthy, nice home, nice cars, lost, lonely, and miserable. Sow your time. Sow your talents. And sow your treasure. And do so without a grudging heart. God looked at broken lost people. People nobody wanted. People the world was willing to walk by and pass by. God said, I will love you. I will love you. I will sow myself my son, into your world and into your life so that I can generously reap my family and bring my kids home. Who were those broken, lost, forgotten, and discarded people? It was you. And it was me. And when the day comes for him to reap and bring us home, he will ask us, I gave and I gave and I gave and I gave and I gave to you. What would you do with it? We will turn and we will say, Lord, see all these people? Through you and with you, 
These people are what we did with it. We sowed into their lives, and you saved them. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it doesn't matter what we've done up to this moment. It doesn't matter our efforts or the lack thereof. It doesn't matter how hard we've worked or we didn't try hardly at all. You make us a new creation in Jesus Christ in this moment. We all get a clean slate and a new start. It's not about who we are. It's not about what we do. It's about who you are and what you do. But you're looking for vessels and you're looking for instruments and you're looking for stewards. You're looking for people who will sow and share and give and sacrifice. And we pray from our heart to your heart this day, may we be those people. And wherever we sow, we pray that you, Holy Spirit, will sow the seeds of hope and life, of grace and mercy, of healing and new into lives, homes, communities. We remember this day, Lord, All Saints Day, November 1st. A time when we as your people pause in our busy and overscheduled lives and we give you thanks for our loved ones who've gone before us. For moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, nans and uncles, maybe brothers and sisters, husbands or wives, children or grandchildren good friends, neighbors, members of our congregation. But we knew them and we loved them. And we thank you and we praise you this day that you have saved them through your son, Jesus Christ. We are reminded of his promise that even though we die, yet shall we live. We are reminded of a risen, living, victorious Jesus who is Lord of all lords, King of all kings, and who rules over all of creation for the singular purpose of bringing his church home. For those who have gone before us, we not only thank you, but we thank them. We thank them for their friendship, for their love, for their support. We thank you for the privilege of being able to share our lives with them. We pray, Lord, for all those who need your healing grace. We pray for Dave and Lynn, for Mark and Sue, for Carol, for Pastor Fritz, for all those that are known to us in our hearts. Grant to each of these, your children, your healing grace. Rescue, strengthen, deliver them from all that afflicts them of body and soul. Holy Spirit, give your peace, your power, and your presence to their loved ones. As these are obviously anxious and worrisome moments, let them find peace and strength in you. We pray, Lord, for the people of Ukraine and all over the world who are experiencing moments of war and violence, terror and horror. We pray for peace for an end to the bloodshed and violence. We pray, Lord, for all who serve in authority over us. We pray for our president and our vice president, for all our senators, our congressmen and women. We pray for all our governors, our state legislatures, our mayors and city councils. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to give them wisdom and discernment to know what's true, what's right, what's best. Give them strength and courage to persevere in its pursuit. We pray, Lord, that as we now wrap up a political season, that we could find unity and harmony and concord as we come together and work together to address the issues and concerns of our country. We pray for the people of God who gather here at New Song. We pray not only, Lord, for renewal we pray for growth. We pray for wisdom and discernment to know your will, to be found not only faithful to your will, but fruitful 
as we seek to sow obedience into our hearts and lives, especially our life together. We have many things, Lord, that we're concerned about. We have many needs and issues. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to gather all those up and to intercede on our behalf, raising them before the throne of our Father, as together we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.